Welcome back to the Game Master's Domain. This is the Homebrewer's Cookbook, where I take a subject from a game or anime and adapt it into D&D. Today we have the Blood Code Fighter from Code Vein. And don't worry, this is not a caster like the last two fighters I've made. Check out the Patreon where you can pick up this pack under the $1 tier for one month, and make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you catch all of our videos. You can also join the Discord server links down below. Now I mentioned that this is from Code Vein. And for those of you who haven't played Code Vein, the best way I can really describe it is, um, anime Dark Souls? It's got the same style of combat and gameplay as Dark Souls and other Souls-like games, but with a bit more straightforward story. And, well, of course, more anime. It also has an interesting take on playable classes. You gain these classes by taking in blood from other characters, and gaining different gifts and abilities depending on whose blood you're currently using. You can swap these out as you progress through the game and get more classes, or as the game calls them, blood codes. And because I didn't want to make a third casting fighter in a row, I gave these ones something like the Battlemaster Fighter's superiority die, called Blood Seeds instead. But despite the different name, they do work all the same. Now with that said, let's see what the blood code fighter brings to the table. So first things first is how to take a playable character from a video game that can be built in really any way the player sees fit, and put them into D&D. And honestly, unless you're willing to go through all the effort of making a full class, or you want to do some multi-classing, there's really going to be some compromises you'll have to make. I like making homebrew and all, but I'm not going to make two separate subclasses just for one character. At least not yet. In this case, I took the most versatile martial class, the fighter. Since, yes, the playable character in Code Vein can cast spells, it's never really as effective as just hitting the boss really hard. Most of the time I just found myself sticking to one quick projectile spell, just in case I needed to keep the damage up from far away. My main source of damage though was always weapons, and fighters can use any weapon or armor that they want, and they're great for customizing a martial character. But I also wanted to keep some of the flavor of vampirism and gaining powers through your own and other people's blood without dedicating fully to it. And the first step to that is your first ability, Blood Memory. Drawing from the blood passed down through your family, you're able to learn skills from your ancestors for a short time. This is super simple and kind of like the Phantom Rogue's Whispers of the Dead ability. With this, whenever you finish a long rest, you can choose to become proficient in one skill or tool until you decide to change it after another long rest. This will also help with some of your blood codes in the future, since you do need to be proficient in certain skills in order to use specific blood codes. It also makes for a good trick though, and gives the fighter something to do outside of combat. It can also open up the door for some interesting RP scenarios if you have your character actually speaking to the ancestor they're borrowing skills from. It could even be a family tradition of sorts, where you're traveling the world to gain new experiences to pass on to the next generation, all the while you're being guided by the previous generations who've already done their journeys. Now, these ancestors do help you out in more ways than just giving you skills, since another thing you get to borrow from them is their blood codes and blood seeds. Again, blood codes are very much like maneuvers. They can be an action, a bonus action, a reaction, or done as a free action when certain conditions are met. You start off with three blood codes and learn two more at level 7, 10, and 15 for a total of 9. To use these blood codes, you expend blood seeds, or blood dye. Blood seed dye? Just blood. You expend blood in some way. Hey, if you take a shot every time I say blood in this video, you're either going to end up in the hospital if you're drinking, or end up very hydrated if you take shots of water. You have four of these blood die for now, which are D8s. But at level 10, they go up to D10s, and at level 18, they become D12s. You also get back any that you used whenever you finish a short or long rest, so don't be too stingy with them, since you don't get anything for having extra whenever you finish a rest. Some of these blood codes will also have your targets making saving throws of some sort. For these, the DC is the usual 8 plus proficiency, plus either strength or dex, but that part's up to you depending on your character. There are a lot of blood codes in this, 32 of them if you don't count a special one you get later, and they're all based on different gifts you get from taking on different blood codes in-game. In Code Vein, there are well over 40 blood codes, and each of them give between 3 to 10 gifts, some of them are just stat bumps, and some of them are just stronger versions of other ones. Obviously we didn't include the stat bump ones, since that's not really how D&D works, 
And there are some instances of a stronger version of a weaker blood code, but it's not too prevalent. You also don't have access to all of your blood codes right away, just like in-game you don't have all the blood codes yet. They're locked behind different levels, and some of them have a skill requirement. I'll go over a few of them right now from each level, but just know there's a lot more than what I'm showing you. One of the codes available to you right away is Vanishing Hollow, letting you expend one blood seed die and teleporting you up to 60 feet away as a bonus action. It's quick and outranges Misty Step as well. Now, if you want to take a more direct approach and deal some more damage here in the early game, you could take the Warrior Blood Code. This is a bonus action and lets you make another attack as part of that same bonus action after you expend your Blood Seed die. You also get to add the 1d8 to the damage of the attack. Although I wouldn't take this if you already have two up in fighting, or another way to make a bonus action attack, since you'd just be dealing 1d8 more damage once, when you could use the Blood Seed die for another blood code. Those are two of the nine available blood codes you have at level three, but you get seven more blood codes once you hit level seven. Or you could grab the Fusilade blood code, which acts like a slightly stronger magic missile. This costs one action and one blood seed die. You fire three bolts of blood that each deal your blood seed die in necrotic damage, and you can either have them all target one person or separate into three different targets, as long as they're within 60 feet of you. So if you find yourself not able to do much with a ranged encounter, and you don't have the decks for a bow, this could help out quite a bit. There's also antibody generation, letting you expend one blood seed die and adding the number rolled to a saving throw against a spell or other magical effect. This works on dragon's breath, spells, not quite spells but still magical stuff, really anything that makes you make a saving throw that isn't a martial effect, like being grappled or pushed to the ground. It also won't save you from falling damage, so try not to do that. The blood codes locked behind 10th level do get a bit stronger though. So let's take a look at Goddess's Smile just to see what we're getting into. This is a reaction to whenever you land a crit, and after you expend the blood seed die and add the number rolled to the damage, you gain temporary hit points equal to the damage you dealt. That goddess seems maybe just a little bit sadistic if she's smiling at this. But if that's not your style, there is the more defensive Sly Vengeance. This is a reaction to whenever you get hit with an attack. You expend one blood seed die, and until the end of your next turn, if any creature within 30 feet of you hits you with an attack, they take necrotic damage equal to your blood seed die as backlash. Meaning you could absolutely down a creature after it knocks you out if you both happen to be on low health. But if you do end up at low health, you could always use the regenerator blood code locked behind level 15. This lets you pick yourself and one other creature within 30 feet of you. And for a number of rounds equal to, well, whatever you rolled on your blood seed die, you and that creature don't roll for healing, instead healing the maximum possible amount from any source that would have you roll, like a potion, second wind, or a healing spell. So if your cleric decided to use a 4th level cure wounds, you wouldn't be healing 4d8, you'd be healing 32, plus their wisdom. You could also take blood spikes if you need another ranged option. You expend one blood seed die, and fire three Spears of Blood with their own separate attack rolls, each dealing 2d6 necrotic damage on a hit, for a total of 6d6. Again, you could have these target three different creatures, or all aim for one guy. Really worth the 1d10 investment, as long as at least one of the Blood Spears hits. Okay, last two, we have Blood Codes that are locked behind level 18, and there are only four of these. Let's start off with Sacrifice. It costs one action, and when you take said action, you take necrotic damage equal to twice the number rolled, and you get to pick one creature within 30 feet of you and heal them for the damage that you took. Fighters are good at fighting, but they can't always 1v1 the final boss, and getting the healer back on their feet could be the difference between a TPK and a bunch of loot for the party. But if you are forced to 1v1, you might want to take Survival Instinct instead. You do have to be proficient in survival, and be at one fourth of your HP to use it though. But if you meet both of those requirements, and you stay below half of your maximum HP, you get to add your blood seed die to the damage of all of your attacks for one minute, or again until you go over half your HP. Okay, that does it for the blood codes, aside from the special one that I mentioned, but we will get to that later. For now we're going to jump all the way back to 7th level for the blood code fighter's next feature, Life Drinker. Sticking to the vampiric-ish theme here, whenever you land a critical hit, you get to do one of two things. 
The first option is to regain one of your Bloodseed die, which is a great option really. Or if you need a little bit more healing, you could regain a use of your second wind. Either way though, you're kind of stealing your target's blood in order to fuel your own attacks or heal your wounds. As it stands right now, you only get to use this once per short rest, but that does change once you hit level 15, where you get to use it twice before needing a break. Just uh, maybe get the cleric to check you out afterwards, you don't want to be catching anything weird from drinking stranger's blood. And since this is kind of built off of the Battlemaster Fighter, you sadly don't get anything fancy at 10th level, aside from new blood codes and your blood seed die going up to being D10s, for potentially more damage, healing, and so on. But level 15 does have some more bloody fun with blood taxing. Sometimes you really need to dig deep and go beyond what you're normally able to do. And that's what blood taxing does. If you have no blood seed die, you can instead use your own blood in the form of taking twice your Bloodseed die in non-resistible and immunity-proof necrotic damage. You can use this a number of times equal to your constitution modifier, but just be careful, since remember, you're taking twice your Bloodseed die in damage that you cannot mitigate in any way. That's 2d10 per blood code you're trying to use, but it might be worth it if you can finish off the fight with that one last code, even if it might knock you out in the process. Hmm. This actually might be a bit of a shorter video than I expected. There's only one, uh, well, one and a half more things to go over, so let's jump right into that, with the 18th old feature, Queenslayer. This one's a lot more linked to the actual game and the story of Code Vein, so I might need to explain it a little bit first. In Code Vein, Queenslayer is a blood code you get after, uh, well, after you kill the queen. It's a really strong blood code, and honestly, I feel like I used it for the rest of my playthrough after I got it. Long story short, the Queen was designed to help fight against the Horrors, a whole different subject entirely, but I won't get into that, but eventually she lost control and needed to be killed. She was considered to be an immortal among immortals, and in-game you killed her, technically. So to say it's a big deal that you have this blood code is a bit of an understatement. You've proven yourself able to get past the defenses of those thought immortal. And I really wanted to do something with that theme, kind of like the Battlemaster's Know Your Enemy feature. But obviously this is a much later level feature and needs to reflect that. So instead of just learning a few small things, what you do with Queenslayer is learn a lot about your target. You learn their maximum HP, so you know what kind of wall you're going up against, and have an idea of how long the fight will go. Their armor class, to get through their defenses you first need to actually know what their defenses are. Their highest and lowest stat. Great for targeting specific ability scores that you know the target might struggle with, or just so you can avoid doing something that you know won't really be effective. You also learn if they have any class levels, and if they do, what those class levels might be and how many of them they have. And lastly, possibly most importantly, you get to learn if your target has any legendary resistances or actions, and if they do, how many. You don't learn anything about what those actions might be, but just knowing that the target has them should help you prepare. And that is a oh, uh, no, actually there is one more thing to go over here, a special blood code that you only get access to in-game while using Queenslayer. A great ability if you happen to have used up all your healing and other resources, and the boss is just about dead. This is Final Journey. It acts kind of like a built-in panic button, and costs three Bloodseed die, and for good reason. What this does first off is heal you for all of it. You heal back to full, so already a big one. That already makes me want to add some restrictions of some sort right off the bat, but you know what? Divine Soul Sorcerers get to heal a bunch for free. This fighter can do it at the cost of a bunch of resources. This does more than that though, both good and bad. This code lasts for one minute, and aside from healing you, during that one minute you get to add your constitution modifier to the first attack you land on each turn but there is a reason why it's called the final journey. In game, this is a last ditch panic button, like I said. And after you use it, if you don't kill the boss fast enough, even if the boss doesn't kill you in return, you die and reset at your last checkpoint. The only way to avoid this is to kill the boss in the time limit. And it works pretty similarly here, where after the one minute ends, you drop down to zero unless combat has ended. I still think this could use maybe concentration or something else to make it more risky to use, but I can't really think of anything that I'm satisfied with. So 
If you guys have any suggestions, I'd love to hear them down in the comments section or in the homebrew suggestions tab on my Discord server. This was really fun to make, and I was actually really surprised when it tied with Genshin Impact on my poll. I will have that Genshin thing done at some point in the future. I'm currently working on other stuff I listed in my last poll, so it might be a bit, but it is coming at some time in the near future. But that will about do it for today. If you like this sort of stuff, check out my other videos for monsters, subclasses, and races. And if you want to support me in making this my full-time job, you can follow me on Patreon as well. That will do it for our session today, though. I'll see you next time, and have a wonderful day.